So now is the time we begin to play with mirrors that are not really straight. So you would all play with a spoon, right? Somehow or the other, we're sitting on the table and the food doesn't taste very good. We decide to play with the spoon. And you look at yourself in the spoon, you find that you look very pretty funny, a lot funnier than you usually look. And then you start taking it away in a way, it starts behaving differently. Suddenly you you see an inverted image of you, right? You take it even farther away, something else happens. You bring it really close, you might see a very very magnified image of yourself which looks pretty pretty darn funny. And then you begin to ask what really is happening because we've all played with this and in order to understand what exactly is happening let's let's begin to talk about a special class of mirrors called spherical mirrors mirrors that are not really plane because that we are pretty familiar with which are curved in one particular manner so to begin this what we will do is take let's take a huge spherical thin shell and let's polish the inside surface very very well so that it's very very smooth and let's put mercury on the outside so that no light can come outside like we kind of block it and then let's cut a thin slice of this entire spherical shell big one a large one and cut a very small piece out of it and take it out you have a very very thin kind of mirror with you because the inside is very well polished so it look like you can see yourself in it almost like a spoon a lot more shinier now why do we do this in order to understand a lot of properties that these curved mirrors might show us right we have curved mirrors like a spoon so you take that curved mirror there are some very special points so if you take that curved mirror and find out that center point where or rather the central point of that mirror it's called the pole and so if you have this entire sphere with you and if you have the part over there and if you take the center of that sphere which it was a part of so what i'm trying to say is that if you have an entire sphere or a shell you cut a small part out of it there must have been a center for that shell right now that center is called the center of curvature of this mirror because for this mirror's curvature that would have been the center of the sphere it was a part of that distance between the center and that mirror is called the radius of curvature because that was the radius of the circle or the shell of which this mirror was a part now we have a radius we have a center now this radius will somehow intersect that mirror that point is called the pole of this spherical mirror now this spherical mirror which is polished on the inside is called a concave mirror in other words the reflecting surface is the inside surface it's called a concave mirror so a concave mirror has a center of curvature has a radius of curvature and has a pole right and this line that passes between the pole and the center of curvature is called the principal axis p r i n c i p a l yeah if you have any doubts so principal axis in other words it's the main axis right So now that we know these words why are we telling these words not because we want you to remember random things we're telling them so that we can talk about them in an easier manner so our communication becomes a lot easier so you have a principal axis you have a center of curvature so you have a pole and you have a radius of curvature now it's our time to play with them let us send out some light rays send them out towards them we know they're going to bounce off because the surface is pretty well polished let's see how well it bounces off or how exactly it bounces off so let us now draw and nicely magnify and draw this concave mirror Let us take a random ray, a random ray that comes like that and hits this mirror. Now, as far as this ray is concerned, does it understand or does it even want to know how the mirror is over there and all that? No. If it comes and hits for that little ray, that little part of the mirror is enough to understand everything. You take a small enough piece of the mirror, it look like a plane mirror, right? It was very small plane mirror. So you draw that plane. It's actually as good as a plane mirror in that angle. Now, what you do is that draw the normal for this plane mirror. right why are we doing this because we know that this ray of light is going to follow our law of reflection which we've already proved comes out of lights in a hurry so we know angle of incidence is going to be equal to angle of reflection so we've drawn the incident ray we've drawn the normal draw the reflected ray great so are we doing anything new right now not at all we already know law of reflection now let us see how we can take this even further so now what we're going to do is consider a very very special ray so you've seen one ray coming here and going there a random ray Now let's take a very special ray a ray that passes through the center of that sphere and comes towards this mirror of that sphere which sphere the sphere of which this was a part of in other words through the center of curvature so a ray comes through the center of curvature and hits the mirror what is the angle of incidence of this mirror on this mirror for this ray what is the angle of incidence in order to answer that we have to draw the tangent at that point and the normal but what do we know about the normal for a moment let's set this aside and let's take a circle we know something about a circle if you have a circle and if you draw the tangent and at the same point draw the normal to that tangent it will pass through the center of that circle we know this from geometry so coming back to this r story of a spherical mirror what's going to happen at that point the normal is going to be passing through the center of curvature because the spherical mirror 
and already this ray also is coming along the center of curvature which means the angle of incidence is zero the angle of ref reflection then must be zero as well so the ray in other words is going to is a long story for saying what the ray is going to retrace itself so if a ray comes through the center of curvature it's going to go back the way it came great now you understand why we took that particular ray because it's a very special ray it comes it goes why is that useful you take a random ray what must you do draw it calculate angle of incidence with some protractor then calculate one more angle of reflection and then draw this is a lot simpler you only need a scale draw it bring it back you know that's how the reflected ray is going to be there is one more very special ray and we will see about it now now let us take the other very special ray which will help us a lot let us again take our concave mirror and play with it now and we have a principal axis we know that let us consider a very very special ray a ray that is parallel to the principal axis and let us see how this ray will behave there is which law are we going to use we have only one law to rely on okay any question asked in reflection will rely only on one law the law of reflection and nothing else so let us go into it let us take a parallel ray meets the mirror right now let's do something let's draw the normal at that point it's going to pass through the center of curvature why are we drawing the normal because that's the angle of incidence now draw the angle of reflection use the angle of reflection to draw the reflected ray it seems to pass this principal axis at some point great let's take one more ray very parallel ray draw it again do the same thing put it okay you see a pattern here let's draw one more it also seems to pass through that very special point one more that's also passing through that very special point so it seems to us that all these rays more or less that are parallel to the principal axis seem to get reflected off and get in other words called get focused on to one particular point approximately one particular point what is happening all the rays that are parallel seem to pass through this very special point and we'll call that point the focus because all the rays that are coming parallel are getting focused on to that point right focus is where a large number of things converge to one particular point and then we call that point the focus now we understand why we took these special rays the rays that are parallel because all of them seem to converge at a particular point so parallel rays to the principal axis seem to converge at a particular point and we call that point the focus i'm going to make a claim now i'm going to say this focus is exactly halfway between the center of curvature and the pole of the mirror have i proved it no i've not yeah it looks like that though it looks pretty much like that so you can believe me directly if you want to if you're a very very easy person you can believe me or you can be one of those guys or girls who says hey how is that true you say halfway then why should i believe you great you don't want to believe me go and try to understand why it is true if you really stick with us we will try and prove this to you in a separate module but right now we would expect you to have let's play a game of trust here yeah i'm telling you it's halfway between yeah you can also go and try and ask a lot of people around you they might give you an answer so why it is go find out the answer or wait for it so now we're making a claim that that point where it all gets focused or the focus is right in between the center of curvature and the pole of the mirror which means that if that point is at a distance f from the mirror then the center of curvature is a distance 2f from the mirror with this understanding till now what have we achieved we've achieved without any extra knowledge right only from our law of reflection the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection what have we proved we have taken two special rays and we've done something one special ray is the ray that passes through the center of curvature it retraces itself the second ray a ray passing parallel to the principal axis passes through the special point called focus so we have two points and now very very obviously if a ray passes through the focus it will end up going parallelly after that is a very invertible thing right if a ray parallel goes through focus a ray through focus will go through parallelly so we kind of had three but pretty much it's only two so we have two special rays one passing through center of curvature the other parallel to the principal axis one comes back the other goes through the point called the focus and now you're going to watch with fascination as we use just these two inferences because this is the beauty of physics you start off with something very very small what did you start off with lights in a hurry from there we went and proved what's called rectilinear propagation from that we proved what's called angle of incidence equal angle of reflection from that we've already had some more special cases now we've built one more layer on top of it we have two things we've inferred center of curvature and parallel now let us see with this how much more we can build because we're going to take a spherical mirror a concave mirror in this case and play with it to the point where we predict so many things and we'll do that now now let's begin playing with begin playing with the thing we started playing with as a spoon let's start taking that spoon keep it here and in, instead of going there and looking at ourselves let's do something else let's take a little you know piece of candle little candle and a lit candle so there's some light in it and let's see the image of that candle now 
this is a little you know not so convenient to play with right because you have to take it to a lab keep a spoon and then keep a candle move it around yeah the whole point of science is to be able to make predictions without doing the things and check if our predictions are right because we've already made some inferences right we made inferences that you know this ray will behave that way that ray will behave this way and all that so let's begin to use that because as far as we are concerned the spoon can be replaced with a a spherical mirror a concave mirror and this candle can as might as well become an arrow that looks like that so that arrow represents a candle pretty simple now we have already learned that there are some very special points here our principal axis passes through that and this candle is kept very close to the principal axis if you keep it somewhere there you can't do this problem yeah keep it somewhere here then we can start talking because you keep somewhere there light goes in random directions now it's very close to the principal axis there's a very special point one is the pole other is the focus other is 2f pole f and 2f 2f is also called the center of curvature this point this distance between f and the pole is also called the focal length it's a way to calibrate these mirrors say that you know this mirror's focal length is 15 cm this mirror's focal length is 20 cm something like that what do we mean by that we mean if i send parallel rays they'll all meet at a point 20 cm away from the mirror or 15 cm depending on what the focal length is now let's begin playing right, let's take a concave mirror let's take our arrow which represents the candle let's draw our required points a principal axis a focus a 2f and our pole and as you begin to see let's keep our arrow somewhere our candle can be anywhere right so let's keep it between say f and 2f between f you can keep it anywhere let's keep it beyond 2f in other words somewhere beyond 2f you keep that point and let's see how where its image is formed but what is an image if a few rays diverge from a point and meet again the point where they meet again is called the image because if you keep a screen there you can see them because they'll converge there the point forms an image again over there so let us take two points that diverge from the topmost point of that object because we have an object right now it's not a point object it's a line so it's not a point but how do we imagine a line to be a set of many points so for each of those points if you figure out where the image is then you can figure out the overall image so again and again we're not going to tell you any rules we're not going to tell you anything we're going to play with it and find out for ourselves so there is no thinking beyond to will form an image there we don't know i really don't know where it's going to form let's find out where it forms keep it there let's take one particular ray we can take any any random ray right but which one will you take you're quite smart and we are lazy so obviously we don't want to use a protractor so we'll take a very special ray and the ray we will take that's right the ray that passes through the center of curvature or 2f the point 2f so it goes through and it's going to come back the same way because a ray through the through the center of curvature retraces itself and we know why right so we've taken one ray now how many rays do we need to figure out where the image is going to form to figure out where a point is we need two lines because they two straight lines will only intersect at one point so two rays are enough we don't need more than two rays so we only need one more ray and we already have one more special ray and which is that the ray parallel to the principal axis we take that ray what's going to happen it's going to go straight hit the mirror and pass through focus right we already saw, saw why that is true as well and these two rays are going to meet at that point what does that mean rays that left a point met again which means that's the image of the point that where they began so they left their abode and they started and they finally met again that's the image of the topmost point of our object now let us take another point the bottommost point it's the simplest point to find the image for what happens to the bottommost point let's consider one let's consider one ray right which ray is that the ray passing through 2f what will happen to it it'll go along the principal axis come back along the principal axis itself even the other ray that you take that's parallel it's the same ray so it's a coincident ray it's also going to go and come back in other words what's going to happen the bottommost point of our object will form an image right over there which is on the principal axis itself clearly now for, with these we now know that topmost object where it forms the bottommost object where it forms clearly the bottom point's image is on top of the top point's image which means what the image is getting inverted so you can clearly see any other point that i take and draw do the same thing what's going to happen they're all going to form corresponding images like you see there eventually what happens an image forms that is as you can see inverted yeah it's pretty small so it's also kind of demagnified it's kind of compressed yeah what else can you see it's forming between f and 2f clearly wherever you keep it beyond 2f right it's going to form approximately between f and 2f now why are we doing this we're trying to trying to trying to kind of show you that there is no real memorizing to do here all you're doing is to take a particular object use two special rays where you don't need protractors because otherwise you can take any rays but you'll need to draw some angles which you don't want to do draw them find where the image is and then tell the properties so can you do you realize now that you can do this for anything let's do it very quickly like we have one of them let's take the other place the object between f and 2f look at what happens draw the two rays where does it come there it is done are you memorizing something no you're not all you're using is what angle of incidence equals angle of reflection with that you inferred something 
two special rays using those two special rays. Place it between, you know, beyond two F we saw, between F and two F we saw. Let's look at a special case now. Special because it's a little more interesting. So we'll go there. Let's keep this candle or our object between F and the pole, so very close to the mirror, very close to our concave mirror, and let's see what happens. One 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 special ray goes, which is our special ray, the ray parallel to the principal axis goes there, comes through the focus and leaves. Great. What about our other ray? Which ray will we choose? That's right, the ray that goes through the center of curvature. And what did you just see? These two rays will never meet. In other words, they cannot form a real image. Till now, we saw they form real images. This this one can't. So what are we going to do? Somebody goes and stands there. What do they see? They see it as if it's coming from a point over there. And why is that useful? In other words, look at that image now. This topmost point has an image there. What will happen to the bottommost point? It will still have an image right on the principal axis over there. So the overall object will look much bigger, like you can see. So till now, you had certain characteristics, which we're not going to go into too deeply because you're way too smart for that. You're way too smart to be doing, you know. Remembering if it is between f and two, if what will happen? If it is beyond f, all you need is a scale and a pencil. You'll just draw it out and find out what it is, right? So what do you see when it's between f and the pole? We have a magnified image. It's erect, and it's virtual, right? Because they don't really meet, so you can't re really catch it on a screen. So a concave mirror produces both real images and virtual images depending on where you keep the object. So clearly, where you keep the object matters so much because you keep it beyond two f. We saw it forms an image, diminished. Real, inverted. You keep it between f and the pole. It forms enlarged, erect, and virtual. Everything is different about it. So clearly, where you keep it is going to change the nature of our image, right? Now you can do this. You can keep and play it in the rest of the places. I know you can do that. So go ahead, take a pencil, take a scale, and play with it, and you will see that as your outcome. Now this table, and I, to my disappointment, I've seen people going around and doing, you know, hey, hey between two f, what is it? Between f and two f, what is it? But that's the silliest thing to do because all you need is to understand. Now, I'm not meaning to demean anybody. I'm pretty sure most of you won't do that. But if at all there was a chance, I want to get to the people who are going to would have done that. If not for this, who would have thought between two F and F? What is it? I think it is between this. Don't remember. It's the most useless thing to do. All you need is to draw them and figure out where it is. It becomes a game, which means that otherwise you have to remember so many things in that table, right? Who wants to do that? Right? In other words, you'll become what's called a trained monkey. You know what is between F and two F? Between F and two F? Everything you know, you'll start remembering all of that. You ask why? Like that? No, you shouldn't ask, right? Why should I ask? Why should I know why? Yeah, if you don't want to be that trained monkey, which means that all you'll do is play with it, because things become easy when you begin to play with them. Now, you clearly this table or this all these pictures show you where ob images are formed if you keep the object somewhere. And all we are using even now is traced back to our fundamental principle: lights in a hurry. From there, look at what all inferences we can make. And this is the beauty: you take one small thing, infer everything from that. With this, we've already spoken about all the cases of a concave mirror, but We had asked you something. We had told you. We had made you a claim. We had asked you to play a game of trust. We told you that the focus will be exactly halfway between the center of curvature and the pole, and we did not tell you why. So, if you really want to know why, stick with us and watch this. So, apart from just being a game, you know, where you play with spoons and all that, and till now we've been playing. Apart from that, are there any places where we really use this stuff? Because most people ask me, right? Why are we learning all this? Is it useful at all? It's a good question. Okay, it's a really good question, and it is being used. Let us take a case, right? Let's say you have a bulb, and somehow you want to, like, you know, see front. You don't really want this light to go there and all, right? So you take a bulb, it will send light in all directions. So you want to make it very optimized. That's what human beings want to do. You want to make it so that with whatever little we have, you want to make as much use of it as possible. So let us say I want to see there, and I have a bulb here, but light is going in all directions. So I want to send all this light in that particular direction. So what do I do? I'll take a bulb, and I can put a concave mirror around it, like this. Then what will happen? If I place the bulb in a very, very careful and interesting manner, at the focus, then I know what will happen. Let's say I keep the bulb at the focus, and I have a concave mirror around. What's going to happen? All the rays that go this way are going that way. But any ray that's going in the direction I don't want it to go, what will the concave mirror do? It's going to go hit the mirror, come out parallel. Hit the mirror, come out parallel. So what's the final outcome? As you see, a stream of parallel rays going in the direction I want it to. So now build a torch light around it. We have what's called a torch light. Or you build a car around it. We have what's called a A headlight of a car. All these use this, right? You go and see a headlight of a car. You'll see that the light has a mirror behind it. And what's the point of the mirror? To focus the light out into the road because it's pretty much pointless if you have lights going backwards or sidewards. You're wasting your energy. So we do this. So concave mirrors are pretty well used. It's another place where they're used. Let us say I want to cook food, right? And I want to make pretty, be pretty, you know, economical about this. I'm trekking somewhere on a mountain and I want to cook. I can't really take gas or electricity there. I'll use nature's electricity, right? Or nature's source of energy, which is 
solar power directly so solar power is heat so why can't i use it directly but i keep food there it's going to take like about two days to heat it's not going to work out so i need more heat so i need to concentrate the sun's energy on a large area into a small area pretty useful thing to do and what is going to strike you what am i going to use concave mirror because a concave mirror focuses light right you send a parallel set of rays to it what will it do it will focus it and sun's rays are so far away coming from so far away that when they come they're almost parallel so you have a concave mirror put it across you know such side faces the sun so you have it a set of parallel rays come and hit it all the rays are going to converge at a particular point and at that point the heat is going to be quite a lot because all those rays are converging there and what do you do there you keep a utensil over there it's going to get heated up quite a lot and the larger and larger you make this concave mirror the more and more it's going to get heated and there are places where they put huge large number of plates thereby constructing you know a kilometer size probably not a kilometer but 100 meter size you know concave mirror and then focus it on you can imagine the amount of heat that creates yeah you'll you'll, you'll boil if you go stand there you know burn off so you do this in a small scale to heat some food then you keep the food at the focus then you get a solar heater or a solar cooker in this case it keep a vessel of water it's a solar heater so we can see that a concave mirror has a lot of applications beyond just playing with it but even if you're just playing with it it's good now one caveat is that typically in all these real life situations we don't use a spherical mirror like we called it right till now what did we say you take a sphere cut a mirror away from it little piece and that piece is called a concave mirror if it's polished on the inside typically in real life they use what's called a parabolic mirror and what's a parabola it's a curve that looks like that so you they use a mirror that's of this shape why do they do that we will talk about it second thing one assumption that i want all of you to remember is that throughout our discussion all the things that we said work only under some special assumptions and those assumptions are really really important so i'm going to state them separately so the assumptions that we have for all the things we discuss to work are this one the spherical mirror is very very small compared to the circle from which it was taken in other words almost straight line very close to a straight line assumption one second all the rays that are coming we said that rays that are coming parallel to the principal axis they call paraxial rays all these rays must be coming very close to the axis you cannot keep them far away then it won't work in other words the object cannot be very far away it has to be close to the principal axis so these are fundamental assumptions we're making that the mirror is very very small as compared to the circle it was taken from and all the rays are and the object is placed very close to the principal axis and why are these assumptions very important we will look at them because we have made some approximations even though we didn't tell it explicitly and with, with for them to work this mirror has to be very very small so in our bonus section we'll tell you why this mirror has to be very small you can find out in other ways as well now we'll take the same spoon until now we've been playing with it by looking at the inside surface let's turn it back and start looking at the spoon's outside surface the other words the convex surface as it's called and let's see if you play with this what will happen go ahead try and do this try and take a spoon's outer surface and move it around and see if you what really happens you will be in for a nice uh, nice little surprise because it doesn't really behave the way the inside surface behaved because the inside surface or the concave surface you move it it suddenly becomes inverted suddenly becomes larger smaller a lot of things but you turn it around it seems to be a lot more simpler in other words you see the outer surface it's a lot simpler to understand this let's go back to our thin shell and this time let's polish the outer surface and make the inner surface coated with mercury so as nothing nothing goes inside then let's cut a very small thin slice take it out what we have is a surface that is polished on the outer side and not so polished on the inner side in other words coated with mercury on the inner side then what we had was a concave mirror that was a converging type of mirror clearly this is more of a diverging type of mirror right so clearly you already infer a couple of things right any ray that hits it let's say a set of rays they're all going to diverge by now you already would have inferred that this can't really create a real image because for a real image what do we need things to converge right such that rays that reach it has to converge at some point this will never do that so let's begin to play with this let's take two special rays just like we always do let's consider some special rays and see what they do so that we can play with them let's say there's a con convex mirror polished on the outer side let us take one ray it's a very special ray passing parallel to the principal axis right now the same definitions for the concave mirror hold here as well you have a convex mirror you have a 2f you have an f you have a pole you have a principal axis so take a ray that's parallel to it what's going to happen now draw the normal at the point of contact draw the reflected ray in the case of a concave mirror it the the ray that's reflected will pass through the focus here it will seem as if it's coming from the focus as you can see right simply out of using what the law of reflection we never ever going to use anything else okay surely let's take one more special ray and this special ray 
is that ray that would have passed through the center of curvature or 2f why do we take that see what happens draw that now draw the normal the angle of incidence is zero therefore angle of reflection will be zero so this ray that would have passed through the 2f or the, or the center of curvature will come back just the way it went in other words it will retrace itself so just like a concave mirror we already have two very special rays here which we can play with one of them the paraxial ray that will appear as if it's coming from the focus and second the ray that would have passed through the center of curvature which will retrace itself with this we can go ahead and predict a lot of things in a con convex mirror so it turns out you now for our convenience that the convex mirror is a lot simpler than a concave mirror it could interest you or not interest you but yeah it is a lot simpler because in a concave mirror you saw the depending on where you keep a lot of things change but in the convex mirror it's a lot simpler so you take a convex mirror let's see what happens right so take a convex mirror take a principal axis take an object anywhere yeah a same candle represented as an arrow and look at what happens there's an f there's a 2f there's an f on the other side and a 2f on the other side because those are more important to us right in this case for a convex mirror the focus and 2f are going to be on the other side let's take our two special rays one parallel draw it it seems as it's coming from the focus take the other one which would have passed through center of curvature which is our second special ray and that goes that way two diverging rays as expected it's a diverging mirror it kind of diverges the rays so will it will it form a real image not really so if you go stand there it will seem as if those two are coming from a point over there right that's the image of this point the topmost point of our object which means what we have the virtual image of that topmost point where will the virtual image of the bottommost point be you're right it will be exactly at the principal axis principal axis itself just below that point now what do you have connect the dots what you have is a diminished image of that object between the focus and the pole of this mirror now what's interesting here is no matter what you do the image you form in a convex mirror will be diminished will be erect and will be between the pole and focus so let's play a simple game and finish this off let's take a spoon keep it very far away the convex surface facing you really really far away and bring it closer and closer and closer and closer and closer all you will see is an erect image of you smaller than you are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you go closer so clearly you keep an image keep an object very very far away bring it closer and closer and closer at at infinity or very very far away the image formed will be a virtual erect image that is right almost at the focus a highly diminished image almost a point image at the focus and as you as you can see as you bring it closer and closer and closer and closer and closer the image will become slightly larger and larger and larger and larger and larger never ever becoming as large as the object always diminished and always moving from the focus near the pole so this will be the motion of it a lot simpler for a convex mirror as you can see a concave mirror was more complex so how could we use this that's the question right finally finally the question of doing all this is where could we use this in real life where do we want things to appear smaller because when things appear smaller you can see large amount of things right so a large object is there and you see only that you can't see much so there are cases where it doesn't really matter how large it is but you want to see a large area so it's a curving road what do you see there a large convex mirror place so that when you go there you know exactly what's happening on the other side so you're forewarned about any vehicle that comes there pretty useful and you would have seen something that almost everybody would have seen this objects in the mirror are closer than they appear where do you see them on rear view mirrors right so what kind of a mirror is a rear view mirror do you want it to be concave or convex depends on what you need what will a concave mirror do depending on from where you see it might show you it might take rays and converge it towards you right but how useful is that in a case like a road what do you need in a road you want to see as wide as possible and what is going to help you do that a convex mirror the only disadvantage maybe is that the objects are actually smaller than what they really are you know they'll appear smaller which also means they'll appear farther away yeah but actually they're closer that's what the mirror is trying to warn you you know if it looks a little far away don't buy that it could be a lot closer right so a rear view mirror uses a convex lens convex mirror right so that you can see it and you see a cover a larger area it's a pretty interesting thing here that when you keep the rear view mirror very close to you what happens is there are blind spots as you can see if you have a convex mirror if the object is very close to you if there's a bike coming right behind your car right right very close to your car you can't see it because the ray that comes from that will not reach you it's a problem so ideally it's better if you keep the rear view mirror somewhere in the front near the bonnet but yeah we don't one it doesn't look good two it's going to be really far away you can't see it very clearly because you have to see through the glass it's going to be a little hard and the, and the thing will stop you so you kind of have a trade off here and you keep the mirror close to you some people kind of circumvent this problem by putting a little you would have seen this a little uh, circular thing that they stick to the mirror it's concave 
what it does is that the overall mirror the convex mirror shows you the big picture this little thing shows you there's someone very close by so it's the best of both worlds so it's a good work around to the problem that the mirror being too close offers you so rear view mirrors large par- large mirrors that where you want to uh, you know see the whole thing that's happening all these use convex mirrors so both concave and convex as you can see have a lot of applications beyond just playing with them but playing with them alone itself is quite a lot of fun so uh, you didn't really ask us or we told you that we'll tell you in a, in a while when we said that the focal length of a concave lens of a concave mirror is going to be exactly half of its radius of curvature so we didn't really prove that did we we take a spherical mirror we said that f equals r by 2 or r equals 2f either way now we told you we'll kind of tell you how this works and the truth is it doesn't really work that way we like to right it's just an approximation a spherical mirror doesn't really focus at all it focuses in an approximate manner right now to understand why we do this it's an approximation first point number 1 which means if you tried to prove this on paper you would have a very very hard time because it is not true proving a thing that is not true is a little harder than proving something that is is true now what does a focusing system do in order to understand what we meant we'll have to understand what a focusing system does when you have to focus something onto a point we have to make sure that all the rays take the same time to go to that point why is that true because if one of those paths was quicker than all of the other paths then what would happen light would take the quickest path so how can i ma- make light take many paths by making all of them take equal time pretty simple idea right where does it come from for mass principle of least time or lights in a hurry so if you understand this then what do you know i have to create something where a some kind of a surface where all the rays if it travels this distance and comes another one distance and comes another one all the sums of those lengths have to be equal so that the times they take also must be equal so should i if i have to achieve this i have to create a surface so let me try and create a surface where light travels this way gets bounced off and comes here this length plus that length is equal i create one more that length plus this length is equal and so on if i keep doing this i'll end up having a particular surface it turns out that is not spherical if it were we would have created spherical surfaces but it's not what we get is actually what's called a parabola right so it's a little more different than a than a, than a sphere or a circle it's not so a parabola has a perfect focus or that's how it's been defined so when you have a parabolic mirror it focuses perfectly but a spherical mirror does not then why do we use spherical mirrors why not we use parabolic mirrors because they focus in a more perfect manner it's because spherical mirrors are a lot more easy to manufacture than parabolic mirrors and that's why we do that so it's we've, been, we've kind of cheated you in one way spherical mirrors don't focus parabolic mirrors actually focus but i guess you'll play you'll stay with us because spherical mirrors are more easy to make and and to a good approximation as long as the sphere is small enough that's why we say that the mirror has to be quite small so that in that little distance a sphere and a parabola are almost the same so if you were to do that then the focus is going to be approximately at r by 2 and that's good enough for us